Many thanks to our three speakers. Um, such interesting, such interesting presentations. And we have a number of questions that have come through in the question and answer um, box. And uh, let me begin by going, going through the first few questions. And for participants, uh, please continue to add questions to the Q&A. Uh, this first question is for Anna Jackson. Um, uh, Sinead Bilbar writes that I was sad not to attend uh, Kimono to Catwalk. I did love the videos. Were there historical works borrowed from Japan? And if so, what was the display relative humidity? Uh, and then there is a follow on question in which she also uh, asks, it seemed that both the VMA show and the Tohaku show took the same approach to the display of Meisen, Meisen Kimono. Why the tall wall of Kimono? Was that because of graphic quality? Okay, uh, yes, we worked very closely with colleagues in Japan, particularly to borrow historic kimono, because we, like many, most European museums, the majority of our kimono date to the 19th century, the earliest are about 1780. And I think we borrowed from six um, institutions in Japan and two private collectors. And we also borrowed from the Kyoto Costume Institute for the, um, some of the Western fashions. Um, as for the relative humidity, I can't remember there being a particular uh, problem with the fact that humidity in Asian museums is sometimes different. So I think they were prepared to accept our rules, which is 40 to 60 degrees of relative humidity with no fluctuations more than 5%. But we work quite closely with colleagues in Japan about choosing particular uh, garments. Um, as for the Tohaku exhibition on kimono, um, the idea was, um, uh, the curator there, Oyama Yuzahura, uh, and us and I are quite uh, good friends. And the idea was that our exhibitions were going to be on at the same time. Uh, although of course that didn't happen because of COVID. Um, so they kind of dealt with some similar themes, but also some, some differences in the way that things were presented very much. Regarding the uh, Mason kimono, the kimono from the early 20th century, we had talked quite a lot about how to, uh, display these because we wanted really, for us, we wanted very much to show that suddenly because of these new methods of, of dyeing and weaving uh, that, that allowed kimono not to be mass produced as we would think of them as sort of batch, batch produced because they were done with stencils. This idea that people could go into a shop, into a modern department store and buy a beautifully patterned kimono for the very first time, it didn't have to be a special commission. So we really wanted to show something of the abundance of these garments. So we did think about how to, how to display them, whether we should just pile them up and things like that. But it's actually our designers who came up with that idea of, of that kind of room, because obviously we have a sort of limited space in the VNA, uh, the way that things circulated in the space of the actual rooms that we move through. So it was kind of a display method that, that chimed with what we were trying to achieve, but also something we could do in space and was very interesting for the designers. I know for Tohaku's uh, display, uh, they had their sort of frame, and I think that was very much for sort of graphic, uh, for the idea of sort of showing them as graphic images, they were framed as if they were images. Um, so I think it was just a slight coincidence that they turned out very similar. Um, that the, uh, the curator there, of course, saw my show because she was the courier. So she saw my show before she installed her own. So I don't know whether she kind of thought, oh God, that was what I was going to do, or whether she thought that was somehow something good because it, they looked very similar. I don't know. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Christy Schur, who writes, uh, thank you, Dr. Wu, for an informative talk. My question is related to the sculpture of Prince Shotoku at age two, Shotoku at age two. The sculpture at the Seattle Asian Art Museum looks almost identical to the one at the Harvard Art Museum. However, many devotional items were discovered inside the Harvard sculpture. Do you know if these two sculptures have any relationships with each other and are there any artifacts discovered from the Seattle sculpture of Prince Shotoku? Thank you for the question. We know um, both were from the same source, Yamanaka, and both were acquired in the same year in 1936. But um, the Seattle one didn't have any devotional items inside. We did take the little guy for x-ray um, examination, but we didn't found anything inside, but it doesn't mean that it, there wasn't any devotional item inside before it came to Seattle. 
Um, but if those two, whether or not those two objects um, are related, um, I think ours is a slightly later than Harvard's. And if you put the two together, actually Harvard's um, has more red color on the skirt than uh, the Seattle ones. And there are a group of Shotoku at 82 sculptures out there. The Princeton Art Museum also has one. So um, it's not that um, only the Seattle and Harvard um, have similar sculptures. Excellent, thank you. Um, our next question comes from uh, Chelsea Foxwell. Uh, and she says, I have a question for Xiaojin Anna Enping. Um, it's so great that your galleries are able to juxtapose works of different cultures, mediums, and time periods. I am wondering about some practical considerations. How easy is it for you to switch out fragile works for rotations? Did you conceive the permanent galleries from the start with a list of future rotations of select works? Also, in juxtaposing works of different cultures, do you have access to works that are ordinarily displayed or housed in the museum's other departments or locations? Uh, shall I go first? Um, go well, yeah, we're constantly kind of thinking ahead for the kind of rotations that we might do in future. So we know um, we, sit, we fit into a program that, that covers all uh, environmentally sensitive works within the museum. So we just have to fit you know, around changes in each gallery and they try and unify when those changes are made. So we have a sort of idea about when we can do things, although we also try and sneak in sometimes certain changes. Um, it's not so difficult to do. Um, it's just the usual the time and resources that any museum are stretched, um, as they often are. In terms of um, sharing objects, I mean, I think in the past, the, there were quite strong divisions between the different curatorial departments. And there were even times, say, in our thematic galleries, like the British galleries, for example, you'd get a case of metalwork and a case of ceramics, never would the two be interconnected. Uh, that was about, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Now, of course, everyone works together much more seamlessly. And um, certainly for the uh, dress and textile collections, they're all stored together. And so we have access, so I can go and look through the Western fashions in the same way that, that my colleagues in uh, the Western Fashion Department could look through the uh, collections of Asia. But, you know, we're all inter sort of connected and we work very closely together. And I think there's a growing interest for us as well in the idea about objects that don't conform to easy classifications about where they come from. Um, you know, we have amazing garments, uh, Chinese dragon robes that were transformed into sort of informal wear, sort of nightgowns, banyans in, in Europe, but we have, uh, Indian objects that actually we've realized are embroidered by Chinese embroiderers. Um, you know, things from, it, from Asia that ended up in Egypt. So, so we, we're quite interested in these kind of hybridities and these kind of stories that we can tell across the collections now. So that's, that's something I think we work more and more coherently together. The only difficulty sometimes comes, of course, that is that you can tell all sorts of different stories through one object, but they only have one physical presence. So sometimes we have a bit of a kind of like objects that uh, were decorated in Syria, but traded through Venice. So they are in our Middle Eastern gallery, but, they were, but when our European galleries opened, there was this sort of debate that they wanted to put it in the bit that showed about the trade with Asia. And it's, so it's like, whose who's object is it? And whether we just move them around or, you know, how do we represent them in more than one place? Um, it's interesting with audiences though, because that uh, sometimes people don't react very well to things that they can't easily classify. So that export kimono that I showed, which has been incredibly popular with, with those audiences who come to the show, everyone seems to really love it. But when we first acquired it, the person we bought it from, who was a sort of amateur collector dealer, put something on her Facebook page about the fact that the VNA had had acquired this object from her. And I, we, the VNA, I got a what was essentially a really rude email from someone in America who was a kimono enthusiast saying they couldn't believe the VNA had bought something that wasn't a real kimono and that obviously we had no scholars who knew anything about kimono. So I had to write back and explain that we, you know, we were interested in this object purely because it was specifically made in Japan for export to the West and that we did kind of vaguely know what we were doing. 
uh, can I just say that um, that was really great to hear that um, you have s such similar experiences as us in trying to negotiate where an object really belongs. Um, so a similar case for us, which is, uh, well, we, one of the difficulties for us is of course, we have several sites, different buildings that comprise the Seattle Art Museum. Um, so for example, our Islamic collection formerly was really only showed in our downtown facility. So one of our interests in this renovation project was to bring some of those objects over without denuding the gallery that was downtown. So there was a lot of the negotiation as to what objects would fit into the themes that we had in mind versus uh, how we wanted to keep the gallery downtown uh, intact. So that, uh, that was just a similar, um, similar um, we had these lists and I will take this one and you take that one <laughs> kind of a negotiation, yeah. And I would also add um, the themes we came up with each gallery are um, really um, drawn from the strength of the collection. So we, we started with a really deep dive into the collection, see what we have. And um, so we actually have a gigantic spreadsheet that would take us through um, in the next five or six rotations, because um, as many other museums, we rotate like sensitive materials every six months or so. So for example, um, the gallery for secret texts and tales, we don't have enough materials mm -hmm. to sustain six rotations. So that gallery actually will come down after two changeovers and became a part of a, a temporary um, exhibition space. And in the past, because the Japanese collection is stronger in painting textile or the light sensitive materials, so the South Wing galleries would rotate every six months or so for special exhibitions or for collection installations. But now with this new framework, new setup, um, the works that need to be rotated out are spread out, um, not in like one wing or in one gallery. So um, it just means it's an ongoing process. We um, feel like we're going through this reinstallation every six months or so. Now the three curators uh, are um, finalizing the checklist for the July rotation and started working on the checklist for December rotation. So um, I think, yeah, the fun is, is never gonna end. <laughs> so some galleries have no rotations whereas other galleries will have basically be a whole new show every single, every six months. Um, so we had worried that this was going to be the major uh, Achilles heel of these kind of display. But as it turns out, it, I don't know about how you feel judging, but it turns out to be quite fun um, and requires a lot of creative thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the issue here at the VNA. We don't rotate quite as much as you, quite as regularly as you do, I must admit. But we are moving all our stores from um, West London to East London, and they are effectively uh, inaccessible for a number of years. So we've had to make these very quick decisions about what are we going to rotate. For me, all the textiles, or the, you know, so I've, so I've had to extract them all from the store and try and find spaces to store them actually in South Kensington in the museum itself, so that I've got enough rotations to keep me going through the next few years and things like that. And that's been a bit of an exercise. Well, thank you. Um, our next question is uh, uh, comes in from an anonymous is an anonymous question, and this one is for Dr. Fung. What possibilities for exhibition and scholarship do you see in articulating a maritime culture encompassing South China, Southeast Asia, and the Chinese diaspora in West Coast US, apart from national boundaries? Mm. Uh, what a broad and interesting um, question. Uh, doesn't have to be just for me, by the way. <laughs> uh, if others have a comment, please join in. But I would say um, that maritime culture is a very great possibility for a theme. So the 13 themes that we settled on um, 
We worked on it with a couple of things in mind. We, it, as I explained very briefly, it grew out from the collections on, that we had. So in the room, we gathered together clusters of works, which we felt, number one, were both broad enough to do rotations over a long period of time. And number two, easily represented by the strengths of the collection. So maritime, maritime culture is an area which conceivably we could do it. Um, so that uh, I will hold in my back pocket as a future possible theme. Um, we don't, so we just have to look at it in terms of the numbers, uh, whether it's possible to keep up for the length of time. So every museum will have different ability to do something like that. So for example, Peabody Essex would be able to do it for inf indefinite amount of time. Whereas we, our collection is a little bit smaller in the area. Uh, I myself am thinking of doing um, a small show uh, about maritime culture in my, my one small downtown gallery. So I figure it can be either a special exhibition or a theme in this uh, Asian art museum. So what I'm saying is special exhibition and permanent display need not be so clearly separated. At, that is that the concept of a thematic permanent gallery is in fact closer to that of a special exhibition. So um, that's, that's um, uh, so maritime culture is one of those threads which could in fact tie together different parts of the world, including uh, Europe and South China and Southeast Asia. And we actually have what is the, the museum calls a porcelain room, which does exactly that, which is um, uh, puts in one room uh, the, uh, the uh, ceramic uh, cultures uh, from both East and West. Um, so that's a, sort of a broad, I haven't even gotten to this next part yet, which is the Chinese diaspora. Uh, perhaps we can just talk about the diaspora in general between the three of us. Going back to what you were saying about ceramics, I should say that in the museum, you know, we do have galleries where, where, which we have constructed together with other departments. So our ceramics galleries very much looks at sort of transmission of, of, of design, of technologies. You know, we've got a display on blue and white, for example, that looks all out on lusterware and things like that. And we hope again to work on a global fashion gallery um, in the future as well, money permitting and so on. With the diaspora, we always have that thing about, you know, we're the Asian department, so how do we define what we collect? Should we only collect things from Asia that were made in Asia? Of course, we don't do that. We do uh, acquire from the diaspora. And of course, our Western-based departments, particularly when they're collecting the contemporary, you know, they're, they're, they're equally global in, in outlook. So it's this idea you can be global and out, you know, you can be global in your collecting from whatever angle you happen to be looking at it. So, so many of the artists that we you know, collected, like fashion designers or photographers, don't particularly want to be defined as Asian. They just mm -hmm. happen to be Asian. Uh, There's always been a bit of a division in the past that which well, I always found a bit odd in the sense for, for, for my area that uh, we collected contemporary kimono, but Yoji Yamamoto and Izzy Miyake were collected by the Western fashion design because they were, um, you know, international designers. So it's this point, whenever somebody becomes international and stops being Japanese, they get, they move across. Now, of course, we tend to collect things together. And it's just wherever, it doesn't really matter where they are as long as we collect them. Thank you. This, um, this next question is from uh, Christina Yu. Um, I have a two-folded question on transnational display. On the practical level, how did your general audience respond to it? What about docents and gallery guides? Do they see them aligned or not? On the theoretical level, what are your strategies to balance between unifying Asian cultures and highlighting specificity of region, regional cultures of Asia? Mm -hmm. I think those are the big questions we, um, we've been struggling with throughout the process. And we know um, the docents and the general public, on one hand, they want some um, fresh ideas, fresh look in the gallery, but on the other hand, they um, understand it's a challenge for them to do things differently. So I, I um, from my experience, well, the museum only opened for five weeks <laughs> before it had to close down. 
but through those tours we did um, in the interim, um, the feedback I got is that people feel like they've got more out of the collection. They've got more um, from the display and they commented it. Now they feel like they have much more to see, much more to think about um, in our current new display. So um, I think, yeah, it, it would be a, a learning curve for everybody um, to get used to this new way of displaying things. But um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the one of the impetus for us to do this way is um, the average attention span of an average person in today's time. Um, in order for them to spend an hour or more in the gallery, you just have to plan lots of excitement in the gallery rather than to lay out um, like a, a whole gallery of bronzes or, or stonewares for them to um, go through by time period. So um, how to balance that um, cross-cultural um, emphasis on the diversity and connection and the uh, specificity of um, each individual culture. So that's, again, we're fully aware of that. That's a big challenge. But uh, when we are planning for the themes, I think some naturally came up um, as a way of um, to, to emphasize this certain um, regional um, specificity, like in the um, burial culture gallery, we uh, realized there's nothing from South Asian or Southeast Asian collections because it was not a part of their culture. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. Um, we also learn from each other through this planning process. And also in the um, gallery where we um, feature image and the word calligraphy. So we have calligraphy from China, Japan, Korea, but also Islamic world. And um, to think about um, the the hierarchy of art forms uh, where calligraphy was regarded the highest form of art in those societies. So um, I guess, yes, it's, it's a really kind of challenging balance or nuance, but we did, um, we did plan um, as much as we could and as much as the collection allows us to do. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Yu Hong Li. Uh, and this question is for Ping. Thank you for your wonderful talk. I was curious about your discussion of Asia as method. At the time, it appeared that Asia was no longer a geographical category, but a means to resist imperialism. Consequently, Takeuchi argued that Cuba could also be considered part of Asia. I was wondering about your thoughts about this since I noticed that some of the exhibitions you mentioned want to make connections not only within Asia as a geographical category, but also Asia as an ideal. Uh, yeah, so this is a very interesting question. Uh, I think uh, this particular thinker is, uh, ha is very interesting and has recently um, uh, received so, so much attention in the academic uh, arena. Um, and the uh, exhibition that I brought up was a contemporary art exhibition from around 2000, which took uh, Takeuchi's thinking as his intellectual anchor. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily we are, um, I'm just uh, mentioning the, my hope to engage um, perhaps others to think creatively about where one's intellectual anchor may lie. Uh, in this case, if it's not geographic uh, for uh, in the intellectual arena, um, for the general audience, I think it's very difficult to present that argument. Um, even the simplest question, uh, how do museums define Asia was so difficult to answer. Every museum defined it differently. Some included Australia as part of Asia um, and its physical location, of course, that makes quite a bit of sense. 
in, in that area. Why is Australia not part of Asia? That's the question. And the other is, of course, what about Africa? Um, in our case, we included an object from Tunisia um, as our comparison to, uh, in terms of the gold and uh, indigo manuscript. Uh, so that one certainly uh, plays with the geographic boundaries in a, a sort of fast and loose way because we wanted to make the connect to to raise a question is what is the relationship between I mean we didn't have answers but we wanted to take the occasion to rate to use exhibition as a way to raise questions because we didn't have answers so uh, what I'm saying is that um, I think uh, you know theoretically I think it's um, uh, for me, it's very productive to be able to use the show to not only present uh, an authoritative answer, but to actually just create a situation where, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Let me ask others who might. Uh, I know I haven't quite answered all of your questions, but perhaps we can discuss more since there are a few other questions and we're running short on time. I have to say, you know, the idea of Asia, not how do you define Asia? I mean, Asia is a construct since it's the same bit of land as Europe. But um, our, in, the, in the department, uh, our department, the Asian department, we also have the Middle Eastern collection. And that includes all the objects from Islamic North Africa. It includes objects from Islamic Spain. It includes objects that essentially are from the Balkans, but they happen to be part of once part of the Ottoman Empire. So we're gradually encroaching, you know, encroach on our European colleagues. But Perhaps it, it should all be defined as Asia. Yeah, but again, it, it creates, you know, really interesting kind of research projects, especially for something we're doing, particularly about Islamic Spain at the moment, for a big ceiling we're going to erect in one of our new facilities that's actually European, but it shows the kind of influence of Islam and it was made in the 1490s, just as all the sort of Muslims were, you know, uh, forced to leave Spain. So, so we do all these kind of interesting research projects together based on the fact that, you know, these boundaries are always very porous and very movable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. I think, I think we may be able to squeeze in one last question um, uh, before... Oh, um, I'm just seeing a note that says, apologies, uh, we do need to wrap up as we have a very short uh, turnover for technical checks before the next panel begins at 2.40. So my apologies for not getting through all of the questions, but perhaps we can entertain those later, um, later today uh, in the, um, uh, later, this, later this afternoon. Thank you so much to our three speakers, very engaging presentations and fascinating discussion and, and question and answer. Thank you again. <laughs>